Welcome to Law 370. This is the second session of the year. And our tradition in this course is to bring in a recognized indigenous scholar to give the students the benefit of a perspective from within about an indigenous legal system. The bulk of this course is about Canadian law pertaining to indigenous peoples, but it's very important in evaluating Canadian law to appreciate that indigenous law is real, it exists, and that it works when the rest of us leave it alone sufficiently so that it can. I am not indigenous, so I am not the person who, who should be trying to introduce you to indigenous law. So we bring in someone who is indigenous and who can speak with authority from within an indigenous community to share. Um, so our guest this year, I knew when she was my student in about the year 2000 as mm -hmm. Donna's Kennedy, her Anishinaabe name is Minawana Gogizhigok, which means happy, joyous day woman in Anishinaabe. She's a member of the Martin clan from the Rosso River Anishinaabe First Nation. She is a second degree Medewan, way of the heart person, and member of the Three Fires Society. She was also raised as a, I'm not going to get this right, female person of big heart. Mm -hmm. by the Ojishida Society in Rosso River. She is of European and Ojibwe Anishinaabe heritage and works to bring the best of those traditions forward. She's a wife, an auntie, a great auntie, a mother, a sister, a cousin, a daughter, a niece, a granddaughter, a caregiver, and a friend. She's an enthusiastic bead collector. I've seen some of her bead work. <laughs> sometimes craft or an occasional beadwork. She is an accomplished scholar focusing on learning Anishinaabe Onakana Gawin, Anishinaabe Law, a community educator, and a support to many of the people in her life. In her work, she draws on her training as a helper, her Western education, her learning in the Three Fires Medewin Lodge, her experience as a Trudeau Foundation scholar, and her mentorship as a visiting, visiting scholar of the Shingwak Kanumaga Gaming Center of Excellence for Anishinaabe Education. So please welcome Menawana Gogizhigat, Donna so, Kennedy, who will have the floor until about 10 minutes to 6 because we'll roll through our usual break today. Thank you. Well. Bojon and Dinaway Maganadok, Minamanago Gishok named as Nakaz, Wabje, she and Dode, Guanish Kuzi, Bing and Donji, Nijing, and Dijimede, Gagigao de Buen Schnabe Quendau, Nimi Gwetra and Dan, Mino Bima de Zuin, Nindano Ki, Manitoba Indigenous Cultural Education Center, MICEC, Eshnekadek, Gido de Buemna. Do you speak Ojibwe? No, <laughs> um, I'm still learning. Uh, I'm still learning to speak Ojibwe. I'm still uh, pursuing my uh, language, but I'm working at it. So I'm working at picking that up. I miigwech for that introduction. Um, I repeated some of the things. So the first thing that I said is bojo, wewena bojo, which is greetings. Nintenawe um, manganadok my relatives. So I acknowledged all of you as relatives of mine. I know this um, because of, not that I know every one of you, but because I know my creation story. I know that from our worldview, I am related to all of creation. From the smallest insect to the stars and each and every one of you. I don't yet know how we're related. <laughs> I just know that we are. Uh, that's something that is a principle of our law um, that is spoken to and spoken consistently, I think, among many Indigenous peoples and Indigenous nations. 
um, and certainly of my own. I also told you my spirit name again, Minamanako Gishguk, and my clan, Martin. Has anybody had the privilege of seeing a Martin before? My clan relatives, they're beautiful, aren't they? <laughs> They've got such beautiful fur. They're all different colors. They like to live in forests and pine trees. We're known to be um, very strategic, uh, very quick, uh, very determined, um, and really good hunters. So in our clan, our clan relationship, we're known to be, I guess, protectors. Defenders often find a lot of Martin clan among social work professions, lawyerly professions, as well as uh, environmental, environmental uh, protection. So I also said where I was from, Bing. It's known as Rose River Anishinaabe First Nation, but Bing it talks about a certain place. There's multiple places um, within that we're connected to as a people. One of them is Bagawanish Kozibing, where our main, what you would call an Indian reserve, a lot of the houses are located on at the moment. And it talks about the river and the plants that grow by the river. And I'm trying to remember everything that I said. I'm second degree Medewin, so I, I spoke to you about that. That means I made a commitment um, to uh, live the Medewin way of life to carry that um, in my life and to do my part, which is a small part, of ensuring that that continues um, for others um, when they come looking, those who want to learn about that way of life as well. And I also said that I am thankful, grateful for this good life that I have been given and that I come to you from um, Manitoba, Manitoba Abi, which is where the spirit lives, uh, also mispronounced as Manitoba, <laughs> which doesn't sound as cool. <laughs> but I'm coming to you from where the spirit lives, Manitoba Abi, uh, where the spirit sits. And I work at a place called Manitoba Indigenous Cultural Education Center. And I'm really grateful to have arrived here today. And I want to acknowledge um, both the law school that I studied in when I was doing my JD in law, and also when I was pursuing my SJD of law, which I'm currently lapsed. I'm like AWOL, absent without leave. <laughs> I'm still. Um, I think I'm in the in-between of whether or not I'm working at it. I'm all but dissertation. So I've done all my candidacy exams and I did my, my research and my mentorship. But as you'll hear about my interest in Anishinaabe and Anakinage, and I guess it might make sense why it takes a little bit longer to study Anishinaabe law. In the time that I um, became a Dewan, uh, I started really wanting to understand who I was as an Anishinaabe person, who I was as an Anishinaabe Kwe. That's something that I couldn't be given in Western education. It's not something that I found when I was a student, when I was going through elementary and, you know, we had junior high and high school, although I wasn't really there. <laughs> By the time high school came, I was, I fell out of love with uh, Western education. I was so in love in the beginning though, like grade kindergarten, grade one, grade two, all through elementary, I was hooked. You know, I loved going to school. I loved being at school. Um, I would not go to recess even. I would be in the library with tons of books on the weekend. My favorite place to go was first our library at, um, in Brandon, then even the university library. Like, I loved reading books. I loved learning. I was very curious. Um, and I wanted to know things. I was looking for answers. And answers that I could not find in the education that I was given. So I needed those answers uh, because of what I saw 
as a young person and because of what I was confronted with uh, in my process of going through school so and in society particularly um, the violence that I saw the addictions that I saw the racism that I experienced and the trauma that I experienced and that I recognized in others so that was my primary motivation for wanting to know about the world, for wanting to learn about how things worked, to wanting to learn about who I was and what my value was, what my role was, and how I could be in the world in a different way than what was presented to me. So for me, um, that really came to a head, I think, in junior high. You know, I don't know if you guys how school works anymore the same way, but there was a little bit of us in elementary school, and then that a bunch of little bits of elementary school went into like a feeder school with junior junior high, and there wasn't too many indigenous, visibly indigenous people in my elementary school, but there was more. <laughs> we went from one, and then my cousin who was there for a little bit of the time, and maybe there'll be one person visiting, but there was um, me, and my little brother, sometimes my cousins who are staying with us, and then every now and then there was one other Native person in the school, in my elementary school. So we went from one person in my class, I was usually the only Indigenous person in my class, to there was five of us. <laughs> and uh, I think we were pretty threatening, because there was five of us, right? <laughs> and um, there was schools, where it was much more contentious, there was a lot more conflict. And so I started to experience overt racism that I hadn't experienced pri previously. Like walking through school and they'd be like, you know, from, I don't know, cowboys and Indians, I guess on TV. I, I never seen anybody do that in my community. <laughs> I never seen that at Apollo. I never seen that except anywhere on Hollywood is the only thing that I seen. Um, but I was also, like, we were called names like Squaw, Wagon Burner, um, Bannock, which I don't know whoever came up with that as an insult. <laughs> Anybody who's tasted fry bread would know that that's probably not something uh, negative. But uh, I don't know. I, I had this experience. And um, for me, that's kind of, I always looked for fairness. Even when I came into law school and I was like, that's the reason why um, I think I was attracted to law. So when I was in my first year and of law school, and I think it was like middle of the way, I was real quiet because I didn't really understand a lot of what was going on <laughs> the first year. And uh, I think the only thing, the one thing that I was, everybody seemed to know something that I didn't know. I was, I'm like the first person in my family to go to law school and I didn't really know a lot of people who went to law school. I didn't know there was books you could buy um, that kind of give you like some of the language. I didn't understand a lot of what was going on. I couldn't afford my books at the beginning. <laughs> so that probably was part of the problem. But you know, for a long time, I didn't know what was happening. And then all of a sudden, I think it was um, criminal law. And they said, oh, they were talking about, I, it was the older version, was it the Young Offenders Act? Mm. Was the older version? And they when it applied, and I was like, oh, I know this! <laughs> I finally had my hand up, because I went from like being top of my class when I was in elementary, and being summa cum laude when I was doing my undergrad degree, to like not knowing what the heck was going on in, intro to, in my first year law. So I was like super excited, like, I know this, I know this, I know this. It starts at 12. <laughs> and my life experience tells me so. <laughs> and then they said, well, how far does it go up to? And I said, well, 15. And they said, no. You know, and they moved on. <laughs> and I was like, I'm pretty sure it's 15. <laughs> I, put, I put it up. I was like, I'm pretty sure it's 15 years old. And then they, they just, they said, no. And <laughs> it's not, it's 18. And I put my hand up again, like this is like, Martins are also known for being persistent. 
<laughs> and me in particular, I'm known for being persistent. I put up my hand like a third time, and I was like, maybe it's different in Manitoba. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then they said, no, it's federal, <laughs> you know, it's moving on, <laughs> you know, and we went on. That was like my first experience of knowing something in law school. And it took me years to find out that there's actually, that even though it does go up to 18, there's what's supposed to be within, or supposed to have been within the Young Offenders Act, a kind of exception where youth can be tried as adults in certain situations, so that that exception is actually um, used more often than not with young offenders, at that time young offenders, who are Indigenous. So even though it might apply up until 18, whether or not it applied to Indigenous youth in conflict with the courts is another story, right? So. It took me years to unpack that and to know that I actually knew something from my life that um, wasn't recognized in textbooks or in classrooms or in the regular way of learning about law. Um, so that was like the first time I knew something. <laughs> Afterwards, um, when I was in, I, I started to get more vocal. I think I was really quiet then. Um, and that, especially that first experience really kind of shook me up. But as I continued uh, through school, I started to have questions about law. I think the second term I said, but that isn't fair <laughs> in law school. And I think that my entire class laughed. <laughs> but that just, including my off. <laughs> I was like, but that just isn't fair. Fairness has nothing to do with law. <laughs> That's what I was told. And then later I found out, actually, fairness is a principle of law. <laughs> it is a legal principle within Canadian law. So I think my experience in first year and learning about law really put some questions in my mind about how we understand law, how we learn law, what we think of law, and actually how law is played out in our day-to-day -day lives. Because um, sometimes those who are practicing law aren't actually as familiar with the lives of people who might come in conflict with that law, or who require that law for protection, or who are looking to turn to that law for fairness. And that really brought a question up in my mind that I think stuck for a lot longer than I thought. And it was deep for me because that idea of fairness and about why isn't life fair? Why isn't the world safe? Why isn't what we learn always true. Those are questions that have driven my curiosity since I was very small. And I think it did play into why I, I studied the way that I did. When I was in law school, I think I was um, pretty infamous for not being in law school. <laughs> I was told that you could miss maybe three classes um, and then you were in danger of not finishing. And I missed every Friday so I could go to a sweat. <laughs> I think I was in uh, Civ Pro for one class in the entire term. <laughs> I also, um, I think in my first year left for four weeks, two weeks to go to ceremonies, uh, which is a week long, because um, we have ceremonies four times a year. That's every season, and um, we're there to greet the season, all the spirits of that season, you know, and we need those. Like for me to be at spring ceremonies and to be there when the waters open up and they start to run when 
the, um, to make offerings, to see the buds of life, you know, that's a miraculous gift that our plant relatives come back to life and start growing and creating fruit that we will depend upon to eat for our life. You know, um, when our hunters go out and they take life, you know, they do ceremonies and they take life and then they bring that gift from our relatives to the people. You know, when our young people, like my nephew, you know, he did his, um, when they first go out hunting and they make their first kill and they bring that back for the people and they call in their relatives and their, you know, their elders and they get to feed them for the very first time. Those things are significant. Those are very significant events and I did not want to miss them. So I left <laughs> for law school and I left for like a week. I was kind of infamous for like being at school and not always being here because I was at a ceremony or because I was out singing hand drumming or I was beating or I was being a helper to the elders or I was going to a sweat. And then I was also kind of infamous for driving these long distances to go to ceremonies and carrying my books and reading. Anybody ever read while you're in a car? driving for 10 hours like it's enough to make you kind of nauseous but I figured out how to do it like you have to sit a certain way you got to make sure you can kind of see forward out of the top of your book so that you don't get nauseous and then read so you can kind of still see the words like tilted like this and then also see the horizon and then you won't get sick <laughs> well I wouldn't recommend it when you're driving this is passenger when I was riding <laughs> usually I drove at, at night um, and also I have to say like I waited for some of my because I didn't have my own vehicle at the time so I was catching rides all over but um, I also waited uh, several hours I think doing studying for tests at uh, casinos <laughs> along route so I was also infamous for that like traveling to ceremonies traveling to wakes or funerals um, being in break at ceremonies and having my books out trying to get my papers done for law school in between the sessions um, at ceremonies which usually start uh, before sunrise and can end anywhere like from 11 o'clock at night to 3 o'clock in the morning so it's like long days away <laughs> I had to find wherever I could to get the, my reading in or to get my assignments done but I think the same drive that brought me to law school is what brought me to also study Medewin or Nakanegewin that's where I looked for answers. If we say we are all given the gift of good life. This is a good life. Why isn't life always good? If we all have a mind and we all have a heart and we were all given that gift of kindness like we're told in those stories. Why aren't we always kind? Why isn't life fair? Same question. And it brought me looking in different places. Um, so I was always kind of in and out. And some people might say, well, it's hard to succeed when you're that way. People say, um, I've heard people talk about that as walking within two worlds. And sometimes it really did kind of feel that way. Um, it's, especially when it's like so far apart, <laughs> it's precarious, right? You got a toe over here and a toe over here. And somebody's looking at you and they're saying, you're only like 10% in this. <laughs> and somebody's over here saying, you're only 10% in this, you know? <laughs> Um, but it seems so far apart. I don't really like the concept of walking in two worlds, though, because there is only one world. There really is only one world. 
and we live within it. From an Anishinaabe point of view, our world view, that world is a world that's alive. It's very different than um, seeing the world through English. And English is my first language because of the processes of residential school and the epidemics within my community and the history within my family. I was raised um, with English as my first language. So learning about Anishinaabe um, language, Anishinaabe Moen, and learning about Onakanegewen, our law, learning about our way of life and our Anendamoen, the way we think about our philosophy. Um, I can, I'm moving also from an English informed worldview to an Ojibwe Moen informed worldview or an Anishinaabe Moen informed worldview. And I can say that from an English worldview, you think about things, it's 90, more than 90% nouns. And what are nouns? Do people know? It's a person. It's a place or it's a thing, right? Generally. So for in English, we're looking at all of these things. And the law is, the law that I learned is primarily about relationship to things. Uh, I learned that in property, you know. It's, um, I know that it's supposed to be incorrect according to law because property is not about a thing relationship to a thing. It's a relationship to a person about a thing, right? So it's about um, contesting rights and our relationship to resources, primarily. Whether those resources are political, um, whether those resources are economical, uh, financial. Um, but the law that I learned when I was in law school was primarily about our relationship to things and our access. When learning Anishinaabe Moen, the language is more than 96% verbs. So there's a lot less things <laughs> and a lot more people who do, who be. And when we think about uh, people, who are people, it includes much more than just human beings. So um, Darlene Johnson, another one of my uh, former professors, she, I remember watching her, I think, give a similar talk um, when I was in law school and she started um, giving presentations at the law school and she said what if it was about constitutionalism and she said if fish are people too <laughs> so and talking about how within Anishinaabe language and Anishinaabe worldview fish are equivalent people too and it's not just fish right it's fish it's trees it's deers it's it's grass, it's berries, they're, they're people too. So a plant, a star, a wind, a river are people too. Um, they're beings within an Anishinaabe worldview. So learning about um, law in a Canadian context didn't prepare me for learning about law in an Anishinaabe context, Anishinaabe o Nakanegawin. And um, I guess when I was done doing my law degree, I eventually found my way. I mean, I think I took a C. I got a C in that Civ Pro class or C plus <laughs> um, that I wasn't there. I had the help of my my professors, because I refused to stop going to ceremonies. 
I was like, law school is not more important than the spring. My degree is not more important than, you know, my grandmother's sister, who was um, an elder in my community. She was like a relative. She was our, the last person who was Medewin in my community prior to Medewin um, pausing to be practiced within Rosso River. So she was the last one Medewin by, um, within our community uh, until it was revived again. And she, our elders, um, she was Medewin uh, from a very young age, and she became Medewin. Um, she continued her Medewin work after. It was illegal for a long time to practice our ceremonies. It was also um, our young people were separated from our communities, from their families. So the primary time that they would have learned these ceremonies, these traditions, um, governance systems, they were separated. Sometimes in my community, two generations were separated by being taken to residential school um, from the communities. In some communities, that could be seven generations of residential school, seven generations of children being taken. Um, in my family line, it's one generation two generations on my grandmother's side, three generations on my, oh actually no, because my cousin, sorry, one of my cousins went to residential school, he's my age, so that would be um, grandparents, parents, three generations and four generations um, within my family where it went to residential school. Um, so for those of us who are raised in the legacy of residential schools who were, for me, I was raised in public school. So that school couldn't tell me about who I was as an Anishinaabe. It couldn't teach me about Anakinagawin. It couldn't teach me about um, my language as Ojibwe. Um, it couldn't give me knowledge of who I am and my value in the world and the value of my ancestors. It couldn't give me knowledge of our purpose because that's a fundamental belief among the Anishinaabe is that every being is here in this world with a purpose, has a job. We rely upon each being doing their work in creation. That if um, one of us wasn't here, there would be a fundamental loss to everyone else. You know, we start seeing now these memes that <laughs> on Facebook about the impact of, that a bumblebee, that the extinction of a, of a species has upon us all. And I think about that. But as a young person, when I was a young person, that's what I needed to know. That's what I most needed to know. Who am I? What is my value in the world? Where do I belong? What is my work? Who do I come from? What is their value? What do they have as gifts? And where is it, what am I gonna do with my life? Those are the main things that I needed to know as a child. Um, I thought law school was part of that answer because I was looking to try to correct um, what I saw as injustice in the world and injustice in our society. I had um, very, I think a very narrow view of law when I first started because when I first started, I thought law was something that could help to make things right. 
for in the world. What I found within law was very much um, limited by a world view that wasn't my own. And so our law, what I found as law, it might be able to help in certain situations. And I've depended upon Canadian law in certain contexts. I've depended upon um, Canadian law in uh, family law contexts, in um, criminal contexts. I've sometimes I've been able to find protection from Canadian law. Other times I had wished that there was protection available to me um, within Canadian law. And then. But the majority of Canadian law is founded upon a worldview that is so limited and constrained that for me, I don't believe that I could learn what it is that I wanted to learn from within Canadian law. So I went, instead of practicing with my law degree when I graduated, I did graduate my Bachelor of Law. I did make Dean's Honor List in my second year. I did um, uh, well, even though I probably spent half the time of my learning in law school and half the time learning elsewhere. But I was given the President's Award of the Native, for the Native Outstanding President's Award for the Outstanding Native Student of the Year of U of T as a whole. Um, I decided I didn't want to practice Canadian law. I went on to do my master's at UVic and I studied with John Burroughs and James Tully. And there I, I said, well, how can we make this space bigger? Because Canadian law doesn't fit for Anishinaabe law. And I looked specifically at Section 35 and the relationship within Section 35 uh, between Canadian law and Anishinaabe law. And I was looking for how can we make more room within Canadian law for Anishinaabe law. And what I found, um, my own view of Canadian law, you can I guess read about it. I wrote a paper that's in the Indigenous Legal Traditions that has most of what I came to uh, find in my master's. It's called um, Reconciliation Without Respect, question mark, Section 35 in Indigenous Legal Traditions. So I guess the title pretty much says it all. <laughs> Is uh, that you know, at that time, jurisprudence was very focused on reconciliation um, between reconciling Indigenous legal traditions with Canadian sovereignty. And for me, reconciliation, there's different forms of reconciliation. Reconciliation can be an ongoing process that could be based on respect. But there's another way to understand reconciliation reconciliation or what it means to reconcile. You can also reconcile yourself to something distasteful or expect somebody to reconcile themselves to something distasteful. You can also understand reconciliation as just a check and balance. Like you reconcile your checkbook. I guess people don't have checkbooks anymore. <laughs> but you reconcile accounts, right? So you just go, well, how much, how much to go to your checkbook, how much compensation? How do you compensate cultural loss? How do you compensate loss of identity? How do you compensate for colonization? That's pretty much what I found. <laughs> within reconciliation is that first um, indigenous people's uh, legal traditions 
were looked at no, as no longer viable legal traditions. They were no longer seen as functioning in the world. They were seen as antiquated traditions that had come to an end upon the assertion of Canadian sovereignty. And that the form of Indigenous legal traditions then at the crystallization of, of um, what then they became no longer legal traditions or laws or functioning legal orders, but then they gave birth to rights that were then protected by the Canadian legal system. Does anybody here speak more than one language? Yeah? How many? Okay, a few. Yeah? I found out this concept. Um, there's this concept of loan words. Do you guys know what loan words are? It's like when you can't express something in one language um, adequately in another language, you use loan words. Like English has a lot of loan words like vis-a-vis -vis or, you know, that I, that's probably a really bad example, but I don't speak more than English and I only speak a little bit of Ojibwe. <laughs> um, but there's concepts that can be stated um, in one language that can't be fully understood in another. And loan words are kind of like English's way of saying, well, maybe you can't express that concept, but we can take that concept and we can include it in English as a loan word, right? So it'll be still spoken in another language and it'll express that concept that is lacking in English. And so that's how I found Aboriginal rights is that a lot of times Aboriginal rights and um, their relationship to Indigenous legal orders, it was almost like within the Canadian legal system, even under Section 35, which is supposed to talk about the Aboriginal rights and treaty rights of the Aboriginal peoples of Canada. Um, it's like through that jurisprudence, uh, reaching back to a time when Indigenous laws were fully functioning, saying, okay, well, this is the one law that isn't already spoken for, that's culturally distinct. This is part of your culture and your law and your system, your way of life that is distinct and separate from Canadian life. And we'll just bring that little bit along with us. And so because Canadian law is protecting everything else, and now you have the culturally distinct protection for the part of you that's culturally distinct, and that's protected as a right. We no longer need legal traditions, indigenous legal traditions, just like we would no longer need another language because we have the loan words. Or you could have the language if you want, it's just not necessary. It's just not um, a worthwhile investment. And for me, I was really, uh, that's what I saw. That's what I saw in, in the jurisprudence and I came to question myself. I came to question how I was investing my time because even 50% of my time given over to um, Western legal education for me became too much. I, for me, I wanted to I saw the value of Indigenous legal traditions as more, more than just a vehicle through which to gain rights and leverage within the Canadian state to make our position within Canada less oppressive as Indigenous people. And that goal for me was very, very far from answering my main question. If our life is good, why isn't life always good? If all peoples were given the gift of kindness, why aren't people kind? 
And what can I do to change that experience for myself, but also for others? Those were my questions. That is what I really wanted to know. And for me, that's why when I started, when I was in my master's program, um, I, it took me a long time to do my master's program. I did well, I got, a, I got their top entrance scholarship, the Law Foundation scholarship, and I also got one of the first master's shirks. Um, so I was able to do two years instead of one, but I didn't finish within two years because one of my friends in our cohort passed away. And I spent time because, you know, I learned things from my family, from my grandparents. And when, my, when somebody passed away in my community and in my family, our family got together. That's one of the things that was just done. We got together. Right away, somebody would start cooking. Somebody would go and start compiling all the things that that grieving family would need. They would need tobacco. They would need cloth. They would need, you know, um, food. They would need somebody to drive them. They would need somebody to help clean the hall. Um, those were things that were just done. And we gathered everything together, we went over. Um, and my grandmother would come over. So that's the same thing that I did. When my friend passed away, I got a phone call from his partner to go and to confirm um, why they weren't able to reach him. And so I made that confirmation and I made the phone call to his partner. And I said, I will stay with him. I will stay with him and I'll make sure that I can do what I can do. I will sing what songs I can sing. I will speak to his spirit as best as I can. And I will be there um, when you come to be with him. And my uh, fellow students, they did too. They, they, they helped. I said, okay, this person, who can go, who can make soupy? <laughs> You know, who can, who can drive the people when they come? This is the time they're going to be in the airport. They shouldn't be catching a cab in between. And they shouldn't, to me, that was my ethic, right? Somebody who's grieving should not be coming directly into contact with people who are just doing day-to-day -day business. Because when you're grieving, it's like, I don't know if anybody's lost somebody, it's like time stops. And everything slows down. And everybody seems so fast walking around you because <laughs> they're doing their day-to-day -day life. And for you, the entire world has shifted. The entire world has changed. And that's a vulnerable time, a time when people need protection. And so that's what why we went to go pick them up directly. This is somebody who loved your relative picking you up and driving you. <laughs> this is somebody who loved the person that you lost who's cooking for you. This is somebody who cares about you and recognizes you that's going to go and talk with the person who you need to talk to to go get the key and iron everything out so that when you get there, everything runs smoothly. So those are the things that we did. And I actually ended up, um, because my friend was Ojibwe, um, and his partner was not Ojibwe, uh, his partner was from Carrier County Territory in Burns Lake, and um, they asked me to come with them and to help. Because he was Ojibwe, they wanted to know how things were done among our people and they wanted to show respect for all of who he was not just who he was when he was with them <laughs> so they were potlatch uh, society like potlatching people and so they did things that way and um, but they also wanted to know what would have been done for him at home right and 
So I traveled with the family to the community. I traveled with my friend um, in the airplane and I was there for a long time. And then when we went to uh, Ser Serpent River where he is from and he was eventually buried, actually my law school, UVic, <laughs> I found out after, because I, I was poor as a student. I don't know how many people are poor as a student, but I was like, I didn't think I was poor. I didn't know I was poor. I thought I was rich until I came to law school. <laughs> when I came from Brandon, Manitoba to Toronto, I found out I was like actually below the poverty line. <laughs> and functionally, I admit the definition for homelessness. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> I thought I was pretty well off <laughs> and privileged, but I was both. I was both well off and privileged and I was below the poverty line. So for me, um, the law school came, they sent a uh, representative to the um, services that they had in Burns Lake from the law school. And I was there and I was, I, I was scared, right? Because <laughs> here I was like, I didn't ask nobody to leave, and I left for a whole week, and I didn't even tell nobody. I didn't answer my emails. When people who know me know I'm not big on emails uh, when things get piled up. And then I didn't answer my email, and I was like, oh, I don't need, and now I want to go to um, Serpent River. They asked me, and I'm not going to say no, right? So basically, I'm going. I don't know how I'm going yet. I don't know how I'm going to get there. And then I was going to have to tell <laughs> the law school I was kind of like hiding when I seen them, but um, they came up to me and they actually said, you know what, we decided, we, ha we had a meeting about you already. And I was like, oh, am I gonna get kicked out? Like, is, am I gonna lose my scholarship? Like, I don't know what is going on. They said, we already had a meeting about you, so don't worry about it. They said, um, we're gonna pay for your, all your expenses. We're reimbursing everything for your travel here and your travel home. And we're gonna pay for you to go to the burial service we've already talked to the family and they said and, and don't worry about anything uh, with your school we'll figure it out after you come back just be with the people and we're going to do this on behalf of the law school because we feel like you're the best to represent us and to show his family how much we cared about him so that was pretty cool <laughs> for for a tough situation but that's something that happened to me in, in my master's program. And it's part of the reason why I decided to work on my friend's um, last paper that he wrote before I started working on my thesis. So I finished his paper and he was, he was going to have published. Then I finished my paper that I was gonna have published and then I did my thesis. Um, and then I was still out a course that I had, <laughs> I had, I owed a course, so I didn't graduate right away. Um, but this is kind of a theme for me. I kept walking away from school at the same time I was in school. And it was the same thing with my, ma with my SJD. I started here um, doing my SJD of law and I got the top scholarship in Canada to come here. The Trudeau Foundation Scholarship, it's worth like more than a quarter of a million dollars, all told. And it's given to, I think, 14 or 15 uh, students a year, uh, PhD students who are among all of the Canadian PhD students around the world and all of the PhD students in Canada. Um, they choose about 14 or 15. And I was one of them. And when I first started law school, I said, you know what, I really want to know, I really want to know our law. And I don't know, this is, might be naive or whatever, like I have, I'm very hopeful. I'm a very hopeful person. And that's something that I will protect as long as I can. And I was really hopeful to learn the law on Okanege when our people. And I went down to, uh, I went in the law school here. I also went down to, what's the, library called that looks like a peacock or a turkey Robarts. Robarts I went to Robarts because they have a special collection with like rare documents too I went all over to a bunch of the different libraries and I pulled out every single book that had to do with native law Aboriginal law Indian law uh, Chippewa law Ojibwe law like I looked up everything right red man's law <laughs> savage law <laughs> 
barbarian law. Like I looked up everything and I had all these books and I was so happy. I had my huge list. I was like, this is going to carry me through my whole, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to get through all these books, right, while I'm doing my PhD here. And I started to read those books. And when I started to read those books, it was like, I don't know. Anybody ever feel like you just got stomach punched? Like just like sick to your, like nauseous, sick to your stomach and shaking? That's how I felt. I read those texts and it was partially me because I read them from beginning. Like I had a big stack and I just kept reading. And I was like, it's got to get better, <laughs> you know? And I just kept going. And then afterwards I was just shaking after. And it was just, it was like being described from the outside with a really, really negative lens. Like somebody who um, thought the worst of you. And that's where I was looking to connect to who I am in a position where I haven't been given the opportunity to learn who I am. I've been expected throughout my whole education to learn about valuable people. People who are legal, legally human beings. Because I'm not legally a human being. I'm an Indian. I'm somebody who is able to be regulated by others, people other than me. People other than me are able to decide who counts as an Indian and not. And I didn't count till I was 10 because <laughs> my mom married my dad who was in status. Um, so, and as an Indian, our place within Canada, as Indians of Canada, and because we're Indians of Canada, and we're talked about in that way on a regular basis, the Aboriginal peoples of Canada, our Indigenous peoples, our Aboriginals, our Indians. We're owned. And the reason that we can be owned, the reason there can be a law like the Indian Act, is because we did not qualify as nations for the purposes of the League of Nations or United Nations. Those are capital N nations. Indian nations, they're small n nations. If you go to the United Nations, will you see the Anishinaabe there? Do they have a seat? Are they among the nations of the world? Do you see the Stolo? Do you see a seat for the Haudenosaunee? Do you see a seat for the Dene. We are not considered nations because we're not considered people. We weren't considered people or civilized. Whether we didn't meet the standards of civilized or Christian um, originally. So that's why we weren't considered nations. One thing I think is really, uh, I found out, because that was really problematic. And I, at one time, I thought I was going to go study in, here I was always leveling up, right? Before I found out that I really wanted to learn our law as Anishinaabe people, I thought, well, maybe if I go international, I, <laughs> I'll find something that's fair. <laughs> but I had, a, I had a little look, and then I was like, oh, no. I looked into the history of, you know, international law and the League of Nations. And I was like, do you know how many nations started out the League of Nations? How many? UN law, like it's supposed to be international law, the law of the United Nations, 
It's presumed to be global, although the majority of the nations in the world aren't represented in that institution. Do you know how many nations started it? Carrie, do you know? I'd be guessing. Yeah, I th me too. <laughs> I don't get into details much. I got a lot on my plate trying to learn Anishinaabe law. You know, this is kind of like a hobby <laughs> to know, to know uh, European law or Canadian law. I think there was five. You know, you can research it if you want, but I think there was five. There was European, and they were all European nations. I was like, one thing that I think is really neat is at the time that they had those five nations, I wonder how much nations the Haudenosaunee Confederacy had. Was it five or was it six? And the Haudenosaunee Confederacy had, they had a confederacy of six nations and they had wampum belts or relationships, uh, international like relationships, diplomacy, legal belts, um, with other confederacies, what's known as the Three Fires Confederacy with the uh, Ojibwe, the, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi, um, or I think Alan Corbier talks about it as the Western Confederacy, but there were confederacies, not only were there nations here, but there were confederacies of nations, and there were legal instruments and treaties between those nations. So there's a question for me is if the United Nations and international law started with five nations, why is that considered more comprehensive than the confederacies and the diplomatic centers and negotiations between indigenous nations? But, we, but they didn't count because we were considered small N nations, not large N nations, because we weren't civilized, or we weren't Christian, or we weren't people of the book, or our law wasn't written, or we weren't gr Greek, uh, using Greek alphabetic texts. It depends upon the standard. But there's a lot of different standards and a lot of different reasons given for why our nations are small n nations versus capital n nations which means that our people are not real people <laughs> we're not a peoples who have a law who have a language who have a culture who have a way of being that is valuable to the world that's why our treaties are considered small t treaties versus capital T treaties. <laughs> it's why our confederacies are not considered equivalent to confederacies like the League of Nations. It's why we're in a permanent forum rather than having a seat at the table around the world. Why there's um, settler, colonial settler states who have a seat over us to speak about the territory that we are from, we are of. The Anishinaabe are of Turtle Island, you know, um, but we don't have a seat or a say in the world about Turtle Island, except as a part of a forum of peoples who have been dispossessed and colonized, which is kind of funny, I don't know, <laughs> These things just stood in my head, like, because you're talking about, I don't actually think, I need to correct it. I, I misspoke. We're not actually dispossessed. We're legally dispossessed. Because we're still here. <laughs> we're still standing around. It's not like I magically became, you know, Anishinaabe at 10 years old when Canada recognized me under the Indian Act and changed the qualification standards. It's not like I magically became Anishinaabe then or an Indigenous person. I was already Anishinaabe. Even though I didn't have recognition of the Canadian state as an Indian under the Indian Act, I had my name. My parents had given tobacco to my grand 
my grandfather's sister's husband. And he found my name. I had recognition through our clan governance system, even though our clan governance system is patrilineal. Do you know what that means? It follows the line of the father. So our clan governance system is patrilineal. But my mother was of the Anishinaabek nation, the Ojibwe nation. My father is of European ancestry. So if you're thinking about that in an Indian Act point of view, <laughs> which is based on kind of a European um, model of inheritance, it's not really a citizenship model, but it's like uh, more like an inheritance law model. Do you know what the purpose of like European inheritance laws were at the time? when the Indian Act was set up? There were like lots of estates, right? Because there was lots of people who were landless people within Europe and very few people who had land, who were legally owners of land. And you had these large estates and you wanted to keep the beneficiaries, the legal beneficiaries, as limited as possible. So you wanted to exclude <laughs> and minimize the amount of people who could lay claim to the estate so the estate could continue itself. Um, and it had the capacity. So you wanted to prioritize very few inheritors who would have control over a lot of resources that would then be, you know, um, worked by many people. So that was kind of the, the model. And it's the same way kind of with the Indian Act, because the Indian Act isn't like a governance system. It's not a citizenship system. It's not a system of governance at all. The Indian Act was set up for one purpose and one purpose only. Do you know what it is? To get rid of Indians. <laughs> that was its purpose. Its purpose was to um, create a legal category of Indians so that the distinctions between nations original to Turtle Island were no longer, no longer mattered. There's no difference between Dakota and Dene. There's no difference between um, Inini and Anishinaabe. There's no difference between um, Algonquin and Lenabe. You're all Indians. <laughs> Small eye Indians, right? Um, so the purpose was to create a legal category of Indians that were individual citizens um, of the state, of the state, they're owned. And they were legally and still are legally minorities. So they're in a category of, um, they're in a category of limited capacity as people, a limited legal ca category. So there's um, minors, incompetents, aliens, and Indians. Sometimes uh, temporarily uh, those who are maybe imprisoned. So there were functionally um, not full persons as Indians. So Indians is like a legal category and it was created, I think um, Laird said, the Indian Act will give Indians a choice. They can either become forever children or white men. So it was to make, uh, to take decision making capacity away from indigenous peoples. They would be treated as legal children of the state, regardless of their age. And then um, it was going to be so undesirable to be an Indian that Indians would voluntarily choose to become white men instead and to cut any connection um, to being outside of the Canadian state. Or it was 
the Canadian state then, but um, and then but people didn't actually choose that. I think only one person chose that voluntarily. So then they added a whole bunch of sections in there that if you wanted to go to school, if you wanted to own property, if you wanted to gather in groups of three, at one time if you wanted to leave the reserve without a pass, which was um, also, which was the um, South African apartheid um, borrowed our pass system for apartheid there. Uh, if you wanted to uh, have a profession, enter a profession, if you wanted to um, join the military, if you wanted to fundraise to hire a lawyer, <laughs> if you wanted to sell your goods at open market, if you wanted to um, make decisions about where your children went to school, you couldn't do that and be an Indian. So people, if you wanted to marry, uh, if you're a woman and you wanted to marry somebody who didn't have uh, Canadian legal status as an Indian, then you, that was considered no longer an Indian up until, I don't know. Some of that's been changed, not all of it, uh, with the marriage. So some of that's been changed and remedied, but not everyone. There's limits on the, on the remedying. But um, the purpose of being an Indian was only a temporary situation. It was a vehicle from being indigenous people, being an Anishinaabe. Then eventually people would come from being an Anishinaabe, they'd become Indians. Then if they wanted to live a full life uh, as a citizen, eventually um, they would become either uh, Canadian citizens, white men, or, or at that time, um, wives of white men. Uh, so the Indian Act, it was set up to be this vehicle through which indigenous people became Canadian citizens. So it wasn't set up to continue forever. For me, um, because I wanted to study our law, because I wanted to know our own Onakanegewin, it was really, really difficult for me to even consider, how am I going to do that? I don't speak the language. I don't speak the language because my mother was in this, raised in a Catholic boarding school after going to the sanatorium because she caught tuberculosis because the residential schools that my grandparents went to were a vector of epidemic scale. <laughs> and my grandparents went to residential school. So I don't speak the language. I don't live on the, I don't, I can't sustain myself off of the land. Not because our people were dispossessed of the land, but because they were denied access to the land. And they were denied the capacity to protect the land. So my ancestors wild riced. They went out wild ricing in waters now that are toxic and polluted. My ancestors hunted in habitats that have been, I don't know, if, it's, if your worldview is that trees are a thing and it's been deforested, if your worldview is that trees are people, then there was a massive genocide in my homeland. How do I practice that law? How do I learn that law when I don't live on the land 
when the relationships that that law speaks to, I have no functional way of learning. When the law that has had a huge impact on our lives hasn't been on Akinagewin for a long time. A huge impact on our lives has been the Indian Act. Because it was because of the Indian Act that my grandparents went to residential school. Some of my great-grandparents went to residential school. It's because of the Indian Act that the laws that say that we are the ones who are responsible for the lands to which we were born is not a real law. <laughs> you know, and that's hundreds and hundreds of years. That's not just my lifetime. How do I connect to that? It seemed impossible to me in this place. But I know what my family taught me. So I took some tobacco <laughs> and I went outside and I spoke to a tree out there <laughs> that's still there, I checked. <laughs> it's like a friend to me. And I said, I don't know how, I don't know when, but I want to learn our law. And I don't want to just to learn our law so that I can prove that I have a right <laughs> to have a little tiny piece of access under certain conditions to a certain place so I can practice my cultural beliefs at certain times. I want to learn our law because I want to know how life is good. I want to know how to live my life in a kind way. I want to know how to carry myself with Gejewa <laughs> Dizuin. I want to live my law. And I want my children, my grandchildren, my great, 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 great grandchildren to be able to live their lives sheltered by and thriving by Onakanagewin. I want them to be able to sing the songs about the clean, pure gift that water has to give. And I want them to be able to sing it to water cleaner than the water that I sing it to now. And that's why I want to know this law. And you know what ended up happening? <laughs> I was really heartfelt and I was always taught that if you're very earnest and you're very heartfelt and you really do want it, the spirit will always give you an answer. But I just got sick. <laughs> I got really sick. I couldn't sleep. I almost couldn't eat. I couldn't think. I couldn't do my work. I, here I had the top scholarship in Canada. I had, um, I had the top scholarship in Canada. I was in my first year of my SJD at U of T. I still hadn't finished that last course <laughs> for, U, uh, for University of, of, um, of Victoria. And then I was starting to get letters in the mail saying, if you do not complete your, your LLM, <laughs> You're not going to be still enrolled in your PhD. <laughs> you have like this much time to complete um, or you won't be in your PhD. And then I would lose my scholarship and then, you know, I don't know what, my life 
my plans would be. And wouldn't that look silly to have the top scholarship in Canada and to get yourself kicked out of both your law schools? <laughs> that was me. And I was like, you know, I didn't know what to do. I kept trying to do everything I could do. Like anytime I could pull myself up by the bootstraps, I did that. Anything that had worked before, I did that. Nothing worked. <laughs> so I did the only thing that it works for me is I went home to my cuckoo, to my grandmother. And I just cried to her. <laughs> and then they said, you know what, your auntie's going out fasting overnight. Your other auntie's going to put her out fasting for the first time. I said, really? Do you think I can go? So I went out fasting in Manitoba in winter. And I asked the spirits, help me. And then um, they showed me a dream. Of I thought it was my mom, but it turned out it was my cuckoo. And eventually I found out, you know what, my cuckoo, that's my cuckoo, and she's telling me I need to come home. And here I was in school, already behind, way behind, like years behind. And I said, okay, well, I asked the spirit to show me what I needed to know. And the spirit did. <laughs> and it doesn't make any sense. And if I fail everything, I fail everything. But I'm going to go. And I asked permission. And I didn't qualify for... Um, because my cuckoo was sick, she was getting sick, and I said, well, I'm going home because she's sick. I'm going to take care of her, and um, I don't have much time with her because she was terminal. But I didn't qualify for compassionate leave because she wasn't a direct family member, because she wasn't a spouse or a child or a parent. Um, so I said, well, they said, yeah, you can't. I don't think you can get leave, so you can't leave school. And I was like, well... I guess because uh, I already left, <laughs> I guess then I'm not going to be in school anymore <laughs> And because um, I'm not leaving. <laughs> I'm over here now. And if that means that I'm not a student, that means I'm not a student. If that means I lose the scholarship, that means I lose the scholarship because I asked the spirit where I was meant to be and what I'm supposed to be doing. That's what I did. And eventually they, I got a different leave. <laughs> Um, they made a leave for me, and I was able to keep my position as a student. I was able to keep my scholarship, and um, I got to spend the last five months of my grandmother's life with her. Every day, every night, and I got to make what we call on Kubajigan. That's a link. You know, our great grandparent we call Onkubajigan and our great-grandchild we call Onkubajigan and it's the same as a link you say oh bonjour Onkubajigan <laughs> and then if you're a little kid you say bonjour Kubajigan <laughs> if you can't say Onkubajigan yet you know that's your link that's your link and my grandmother used to say it you owe it to your children to live as long as you possibly can because every day you are in the lives of your grandchildren makes their life richer you owe it to them to make the decisions now that you will be able to meet your grandchildren and I think in the time when our Onak and the Gawain was practiced on a regular basis that was great grandchildren, you know, because it's on Kubajigan. That's your link. You know, my link, I didn't meet. In my community, you've heard about my mom, a little bit about my mom, a little bit about my grandmother who went to residential school. My great grandmother died in the tail end of an epidemic that killed 90% of my community. We went from over a thousand to less than a hundred in a span of a few years. So I am unlinked, <laughs> but I got to make that connection as close as I can in the physical world with my grandmother. The way that she lived life, the way that she spoke to me, she was a fluent speaker. It healed a lot 
of what I was looking for in school. <laughs> I found in the heart and the love of my grandmother, who would have been my teacher had there not been Canadian education. In Anishinaabe worldview, our grandmothers are our first teachers, and our grandparents are the ones who spend time with young people, not a 20-year-old <laughs> who just graduated with a degree. It's grandparents who have that wealth of life, who are the teachers. And that's what I was able to connect with, the spirit brought me to. And because of what I learned when I was with her, I spoke at her funeral, and somebody came up to me, and they gave me, um, they asked me, they said, Donis, can you, my auntie said, can you come with me? Come visit, you need to come. And I was like, yes, yes, uh, but I was packing. You know, there's lots of work around funerals, and I don't know if people get this way. Sometimes when you lose somebody, um, or sometimes when I lose somebody, I just want to keep busy. <laughs> I don't want to feel it yet. So I just keep doing one thing, one thing. And when you run out of things to do is when it comes. So I was just keeping busy. And I didn't want to go back to my grandmother's house to see my auntie. But eventually, my uncles came and got me. Everybody came and got me. They said, you're coming. And they came, and they brought me there, and they sat me there. And they talked to me about this pipe that somebody had made and a dream that why they brought it with them when they came to my cuckoo's funeral. And then they said, it's because of you. When we heard you speak, we knew that this pipe is the one who is sitting with you, going to sit with you. And because of that, I tried to come back to school right away, but I couldn't. I was grieving. And traditionally, you take a year off after a significant death. And that's what I did. I took a year off. I was given a prescription by an elder <laughs> who said, you need to take a year, and you need to re-seek joy in your life. Every day you look and you find out what brings you joy. And you go out there, you try different things. And go look at people. <laughs> Who looks like they're having fun <laughs> doing something and go over there? Maybe I'll have fun if I do that too. <laughs> you know? Like, and just see. And you keep your heart and you keep your mind. That's how you tell if it's for you. And she said, you go out seeking every day. Find that joy in your life. But I found it in beating. I had I beaded a pipe bag for that pogan, that pipe, and I went out fasting. I went out fasting for, well, my uncle would say four days. <laughs> People count differently in the east to the west, but he, he put me out on a fast up at Cape Coker. This was even before John Burroughs started bringing people back. But I went out, and uh, Darlene actually came, one of my uh, teachers. Um, she came to the fast after I came out from my fast. And I had a vision there. And that vision, actually, I didn't know what it was, because I was like, what is my work? <laughs> I don't know why I thought. I was like, what is my work? This is what I've done in my life. What am I supposed to do? Right? <laughs> and there was all these little girls who came to visit me. <laughs> in my lodge and this is kind of me silly me like I don't here I went and asked the spirit what am I supposed to do and somebody comes to visit me in the lodge and then like I have an answer right but then I look at them I, I don't think you're supposed to be here I'm supposed to be by myself fasting <laughs> I tell these spirits and they didn't they were little kids little girls and they were just so excited the way that you know you ever see little kids move like a little group of little kids. That's how they were. They were sitting like on this little ledge and their legs were swinging and they weren't still. They were all connected. They were all sitting together, close together, like a little group, all different colors. And they're just looking and they looked at me and they said, I like listening to you. I like hearing what you have to say. <laughs> That's all. That was my great vision <laughs> of my purpose. And then it flipped. And they were older, but the same girls. And they were all separated out. 
and they were walking like this, some of them. Some of them were hiding, scared. Some of them were clinging to me. And I was calling to them, and I was saying, come, I'll protect you. I don't know how, but I will. I'll keep you safe. You don't have to go that way. And some of them came, and others said, it's okay. I'll just go. It'll be easier this way. And it was like this huge train station, I thought at the time. And there was so much space in between us. And I was like, how does this have anything to do with law? <laughs> And what I'm supposed to be doing. But you know what? As I just said, well, I'll figure it out. And that law, that dream took me to Shingwak Kinemagewikamik, Center for Excellence in Education. I worked with Barwera Benesi, who was uh, uh, the author of this book. He wrote this book. And at the time, he was uh, the dean and faculty member of Shingwa Kinomage um, He's now returned uh, to his home community and is uh, closer to his family. So he's spending time um, with the lodge and with his family there. But at the time he was teaching at Shingwa Kinomage and him and I actually co-developed two courses in Anishinaabe law, one on Anishinaabe governance and one on treaties. <laughs> I also uh, was able to apprentice with him on our clan system governance, which he taught in the second year in courses that he had already established. <coughs> so he taught me to teach um, in, in, this, in this way with the clan system, looking at our law and looking at our treaties. But I still didn't, we mostly looked at Indian Act and I still didn't know what our law was really. And, but I got to see this Shingwakinamagewikamik, which is an indigenous institution of education that has a covenant. It's called the Shingwak Covenant based on the principles of the two row wampum um, with Algoma University, which has a mandate in education um, and a particular mandate, a special mandate to cultivate cross-cultural education between Aboriginal communities and other communities in keeping with this I don't even know the whole thing, the specific uh, historic significance of the site, because it was a former residential school at Algoma University. It was Shingwak Indian Residential School. And um, Shingwak Kenomagewikamik is an indigenous institution that partnered with Algoma University, which is housed in the former Shingwak Indian Residential School, and is bringing forward the goal of education the vision that was seen by Shingwa Kungs, who was like seven generations ago, foresaw this teaching wigwam. And um, so I ended up teaching there. And that was my vision. Shingwa Kiruma Gewinkumik was the lodge that I saw those first little girls who were connected, who knew who they were, and teaching about Anishinaabe law from Anishinaabe worldview, teaching about Anishinaabe treaties. You know, in our treaty course, we have 13 weeks in university, right? It wasn't until the 13th week of class that we got to in Indian settler treaties. The first 12 weeks of class were all about treaties between indigenous nations and indigenous confederacies. So we got to teach about our way of treaty first. We got to teach about our governance system first. We got to teach about our worldview first. And Algoma University, that big train, and the history and the legacy of residential school is what I saw that second half of my. So to me, that's my purpose in education, is to address that ongoing and continual legacy of, of residential school, and to learn how to teach culture-based education from who we are as Anishinaabe people. And through my time at Shingwak and Amagewikamik, I got to go through the World Indigenous Nations Higher Education Consortium, which is made up of indigenous peoples, indigenous nations who are doing education, culture-based education, who are teaching from who they are, 
according to their law, according to their way. So they're bringing in the grandmothers. They're bringing in the grandfathers. They're recognizing traditional degrees. They're recognizing traditional knowledge. And they're starting from what did our ancestors believe it was important to know about the world and about life in order to protect and ensure that life continues. And to me, that's Onakanege. At the end of all of this, I did my four years, uh, well, it was supposed to be four months. <laughs> uh, four month visiting scholarship term turned into four years mentorship, uh, working with um, Badawira and Benesi, learning how to teach in this way in a Western institution. And at the end of that, I was like, but I still didn't learn anything about law. <laughs> And it wasn't until I went home and I was talking with the, uh, some of the elders that they told me, you know the, <laughs> you know the word onakanegewen that they use for sacred law, onakanegewen? Onashawewen is like more like man-made law, process law. Onakanegewen is the law, like the sacred law of our people is the same word that they use onakanege is a pipe ceremony. And in that pipe ceremony, that's where we remember and acknowledge and call upon all our relations to creation to come and to help us to do anything significant in life. And because I chose to go home when I didn't know what to do, <laughs> with these dreams and this illness that had came after I offered tobacco, asking to learn my law. It was then that I realized I had been answered right away. As soon as I asked, the spirit did and ensured that I would do what I needed to do to go home to reconnect to my lineage, to my grandmother, to my elders, that brought me to sit with a responsibility with the pipe, to learn all about Onakanege, <laughs> Onakanegewen, to bring myself to fasting, to speak with the spirit about my life and my work, bring me to a mentorship with elders, <laughs> um, to learn under the guidance of all of the indigenous nations of the world who are part of WINHEC um, consortium to learn to teach in this way and to connect to Onakanegewin today. And so even though I thought I wasn't doing, well, I'm doing all these other things <laughs> that have nothing to do with law, I found out I started um, I started learning about Onakanegewen from the moment that I decided to ask the question, not in a computer search, <laughs> not in a school, not in a book, but to ask in the way that I was shown by my elders to ask the spirit. So that's what I've been doing with my SJD time I haven't been writing, but I've been doing um, talks and transcribing them about what I've learned in my journey. And I would like to tell you um, that I, for me, even though it seems like a really circuitous way of study, I believe that this is the way um, a full way that I was able to learn what I wanted to learn. And my methodology, I describe after the fact. <laughs> At the time, I was just trying to live. And that makes sense for Anishinaabe because we talk, talk, always talk about, it's about Mino Bemadizuin. It's about our good way of life. We talk about Bemadizuin, our way of life. I just lived it. And that's what I did, I just lived it. But it's a spirit directed community informed and creation-centered way of learning law. 
And I think it's fundamental for learning Onakanegewin because our law is that way. Our law is not human-centered like Western law. It is creation-centered. Our <coughs> law, I believe, is not human-made, <laughs> which is why it can be learned directly um, without approaching spirit. And it's a law that is informed by our elders. It is a link from our elders to our young people. And that's a responsibility of all the citizens of our nation to make that link. So that's what um, I've learned in my approach and that's what I share with you today. Miigwech. Nikanigana.